It's all quiet in the underground bunker. Doors closed, locks bolted. But the great one isn't just resting on his laurels. He's making sure your weekend is even better by giving you his best. This is the best of Mark Levin. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's not called the Main Street Journal. It's called the Wall Street Journal. For a reason. I just want to make a point. Nikki Haley has three delegates. She's outspent Donald Trump in every one of these states. These states have been built for somebody like Nikki Haley. They allow Democrats to vote in Republican primaries, as well as independents. Uh, She's had enormous free media, even from certain conservative media platforms. We're told Trump can't win, but she can. But she can't even get through the conservative base. Republicans are voting overwhelmingly against her. And if these were Republican-only primaries, she'd be getting slaughtered even worse. We have the Wall Street Journal editorial that says Donald Trump's divided GOP. It's always a divided GOP during a primary system where you don't want to become president. I mean, for God's sakes, both times Ronald Reagan ran in 76 and 80, it was a divided GOP. We heard from the John Andersons, who is who Nikki Haley sounds like to me. We heard from the Bushes. Reagan can't win. I heard it in my own state of Pennsylvania from Republican activists there. Can't pull the party together. He's scary. He's this, he's that. And yet the party came together. The difference this time is when you have a Wall Street Journal editorial page that is committed to sabotaging Trump with their friend Paul Ryan and their friend Peggy Noonan and their other friends. We have National Review that just won't give it up. From its essays when Trump was running to today, with certain exceptions, don't get me wrong. They're trying to sabotage Trump. And that's what Nikki Haley's trying to do. That's why her entire campaign now has moved from I like Donald Trump and I wouldn't run against him if he's run. Well, I'm running against him, but I'm not going to say anything negative about him. To full on personal, vicious attacks. She's now Chris Christie. Shows you that she's unprincipled, she's unmoored, and she's attacking. At the end of their editorial here, Donald Trump's divided GOP, they write, Ms. Haley is telling voters she can be the alternative as a uniter that millions of them seem to want. She's not going to be a uniter because the base doesn't want her. It's a message worth staying in the race for. See? <clears throat> they wanted to stay in the race. As is the case for not abandoning Ukraine, Israel, or Taiwan. Excuse me? What are you talking about? Israel? You know, but for Donald Trump, Nikki Haley would not have been at the United Nations. And she's demonstrated no, no substantive actions on behalf of Israel. Those were all Donald Trump. Trump did all that. Taiwan? Who says Trump's abandoning Taiwan? And even in comes to Ukraine. It's not an issue of abandoning Ukraine. He wants to put pressure on Russia. But however it is, whatever it is, they go on. She's also staking out a claim to be the candidate in 2028. Who could say, ready? She warned Republicans if Mr. Trump loses this year, if Mr. Trump can't win over more of her voters... He could make Ms. Haley a prophet. So they're sabotaging Trump with her. She's the latest horse they're riding. They talked up bigly about Chris Christie. They did. Which is ridiculous. But they're never Trumpers. So rather than saying it's time to unite around Trump, they're saying you stay in, and if Trump can't get your voters, 
even though we keep trashing Trump, even though we keep discouraging them from supporting Trump, even though we write editorial after editorial smearing the guy, if Trump loses, well, then hell he's a prophet. Then we have Jim Garrity, National Review, writing in the Washington Post. I didn't know he had a gig at the Washington Post, although there you go. His final paragraph. In the general election, one of two things will happen. Either Trump will win 270 electoral votes, or he will fall short for a second time to Biden. Well, that seems to be obvious. He's either going to win or lose. At a time when even most Democrats see the incumbent as too old to run again. If Biden manages to prevail next fall... Haley and her fans will be able to say to Trump and his MAGA crowd, see, we warned you. There's no downside for Haley to keep sounding that alarm in the coming weeks. The exact same positions, with a few words, changed. That's the mentality. That's now the narrative. That's what they're pushing. Stay in there, Haley. Keep savaging Trump. Keep pulling a certain percentage of the Republicans away from Trump. Because we're playing for 2028 now. Because we think Trump's going to lose. We want him to lose. We want you to keep at it. Because he needs Haley's voters. This is in the Wall Street Journal editorial page and now the Washington Post editorial page. This is coming straight from Nikki Haley's mouth. She said it on Fox today. Um, People are saying it on her behalf. That echo chamber Rush used to speak of, there it is. Who do you think Rush would support? Nikki Haley or Donald Trump? He loved Donald Trump. Loved him. Wall Street Journal is the same page I used to trash Ted Cruz. And I want to say something to the Wall Street Journal editorial page and the people who write there. You have blood on your hands, too. For three decades, you've pushed for open borders. For three decades, you've pushed for Wall Street and open borders. The five-word amendment that you proposed in your editorial page to the Constitution. Thou shalt have open borders. This is why you really hate Trump. Because the corporatists hate Trump. You guys have blood on your hands too. Because your wish has come true. Thou shalt have open borders. They're open. When are you going to have a, an editorial that says, we apologize for our propaganda over decades, demanding open borders? When will that editorial come? Take responsibility for any of it? But you have blood on your hands, too, because you got what you wished for, and you got it in Biden. It's probably another reason you're trying to cripple Trump. You know, you got to get over it. Early on, I was a Cruz supporter. Ted Cruz is fantastic, and I worry that he might lose that race in Texas. But he lost. Fair and square. Fair and square. He lost. I've become one of the biggest advocates of Donald Trump because of his policies. 90% of his policies. Which is more than most. And you know why else? Because he does listen. He does seek input. He does seek opinions. If you're not trying to cut his throat, of course he won't listen to you. I get nothing from Donald Trump. I get my opinions. My stepson worked in the DeSantis campaign. That's public. 
who I also think is a great man, and I hope he is the president in 2028, or somebody like him, certainly not Nikki Haley, who's demonstrated what she really believes. I've seen in Virginia, as an example, for the most part, all the usual Republicans who are losers, the developers, the corporatists, the lobbyists, like our friend Barbara Comstock, others, they're all rallying around Nikki Haley. In other words, the worst of the worst in the Republican Party that doesn't understand the grave threat that we face. Nikki Haley will not win the South. She didn't even win her own state. And it's funny how Garrity and the Wall Street Journal don't write, how would Nikki Haley convince conservatives to vote for her? Where's that editorial? What must she do? What must she say? Apparently that's not her problem. That's not her problem. So we have this element within the media. Forget about the Democrat Party media, which is horrid. But elements like the Wall Street Journal editorial page, National Review, other places too. They keep telling Haley to stay in. She's the protest candidate. She's got a certain percentage of Republicans supporting her. And Donald Trump has to figure out how to get them. But if he loses, Haley 2028. Haley the prophet. Got it? So they're urging her to stay in, to do as much damage to Trump as possible. And if Trump does lose, I hold, among others, the Wall Street Journal editorial page to account, the National Review to account, with some exceptions, and others of their ilk who just can't seem to get over Trump. Mark Levin. Making your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. You know, we've done so many shows on the border. We did a whole Fox program on the border just a few weeks ago. The slavery on the border, what's happening in our own country. And here it is again. Here it is again, a young woman murdered, Lake and Riley. She's not the first and she won't be the last, unfortunately. And it's on Joe Biden's hands. It's on the hands of the Wall Street Journal, their open border policies and demands. It's on the hands of the Democrat Party and the rest of their media. It's destroying our country. It's destroying our neighborhoods. It's destroying our freedom, our property. You can't have millions and millions and millions of people coming into this country. Not know who they are. Now we have Venezuelan gangs. We didn't have Venezuelan gangs three years ago. Working with MS-13 gangs. The communist Chinese, as Peter Schweizer writes, they're the ones behind all the fentanyl. From the material to the pill-making machines, from all the strategies on how to get it into the United States. Donald Trump says we have to deport these people. So they call him Hitler. Become a racist. No, I'm afraid that's the Democrat Party and that's their ideology. Trying to protect American citizens. That's a good thing. Whether it's crime in the streets, homemade, or crimes from the legal immigrants or migrants, period. And it's not slowing down. It's getting worse. It's happening faster and faster. We've had more illegal aliens come into this country than each of 36 states have a population. I don't know what Joe Biden's going to say Thursday. I don't know. They're, they're winding him up, pushing him out, telling him what to say. He'll issue his executive orders and do that sort of thing. The damage has been done. Lake and Riley is dead. 
You know what's amazing about so many of the people who get murdered? They're the good people. They're contributors. They're not the criminals. They're the targets of the criminals. I want you to put yourself in the position of Lake and Riley's parents. There she is, an Augusta University nursing student at their Athens campus. She was on the dean's list. She wanted to be a nurse so she could help people. And she goes out for a jog in an area where apparently the students jog. And she was murdered with a blunt force instrument, probably on the back of her head. Probably never even knew what the hell happened to her. Now, I want you to imagine being that girl's father or mother. And you're never going to see your daughter again. Never. There's no more excuses for this, America. This is unnecessary. Yes, people get killed, and not just by illegal immigrants or immigrants, but she got killed by an illegal immigrant. She'd be alive today. Why would we let people in our country? We don't even know who the hell they are. What is the point of that? I know the point of it. We've discussed it many times. I've been under attack for it. The Wall Street Journal decades ago used to call me a restrictionist. Because I didn't buy their five-word amendment, thou shalt have open borders. I said, yes, yeah, so? What's the opposite of a restrictionist? An open border. And we should restrict it. And we should be restricting it right now. And Joe Biden has the power to do it. Joe Biden has said the border is secure. He has said it now for almost three years. Then they look at the poll numbers. Then they put up phony bipartisan legislation. Mitch McConnell goes along because Mitch McConnell is a phony. He's not interested in substance or anything of the sort. I'm one of the few people who read it when they were finally making it available. Remember, they did it in secret, so even most senators couldn't read it. And all the talk about how it was the strictest border control in American history is a lie. There was a section in that bill that said a president at any time can announce an emergency and basically dismiss the entire bill. Which, of course, is what Biden would do. More Border Patrol, no. More paper processors, 1,300 more. Like, that's going to fix something. It's going to fix nothing. I'm so sick of these lies from Washington. New legislation. You don't need new legislation. Donald Trump demonstrated that. All you Trump haters out there, this country was a better place, a safer place, a freer place, and that's why you're so desperately trying to destroy them, man. Put them in prison, lie about, you support democracy, have a funny way of showing it. He's a racist, really? The black community knows that's a lie. The black community was much more prosperous under Trump than Biden. Criminal justice reform, I didn't like this bill, but he did. He got that through school choice. He championed that. And I can go on and on and on. Tell me one thing Biden has done for the black community. Just give me one. One. He's at least attempted to help the black community. Nothing. Zero. Zero. What about the Hispanic community? The borders are wide open, Mark. What about that? People are coming in from all over the world, more now from communist China than anywhere else. Wow, I'm sure they're just looking for work. But we don't know. We don't have any idea. You think Xi's going to sit on that fat ass of his and just let this opportunity go by? Of course not. Do you think the Islamists in the Middle East are just going to sit on their fat asses and let let a a, a good time go by? Like, no, they're going to take advantage of it. And they have, and they are. In Venezuela, he's emptying his prisons. 
He's sending the gang members to the United States. And he will not accept anybody back. You can't deport back to Venezuela. Now what? Now what? What's this all about, Mark? You really want to know, then you read American Marxism. There's an entire chapter on this. It goes back to oppressor oppressed, the white dominant society. We need to bring more people in from all over the world to limit the Caucasoids and their influence and their power and their privilege. It's basically a racist ideology. They don't look at a human being as a human being. This is what's taught in our colleges and universities. How do I know? I've read their texts. I cite them. I quote them. And there is AP, and they're being slammed correctly. Because the media is in on the damn thing, too. From Fox, conservatives called out the Associated Press on Sunday for appearing to categorize Lake and Riley's murder is more than the, quote, fears of solo female athletes, unquote, rather than illegal immigration and weak crime laws. Riley, an Augusta University nursing student, was found dead Thursday after previously attending the University of Georgia before entering a nursing program at Augusta's Athens campus where she made the dean's list. Sounds like a fantastic young lady. Police have charged Jose Antonio Ibarra with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, kidnapping, hindering a 9-11 call, and concealing the death of another. On Sunday, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, also confirmed that he entered the U.S. illegally in 2022 and had previously been arrested in New York City. But the AP published an article on the murder on Saturday without referencing his immigration or criminal record and instead focused on how Riley was murdered while jogging by herself. It's her fault, don't you? Don't jog by yourself. Even on a safe campus, even in the morning, even when other people are not too far from you, don't jog by yourself. It's your fault. Riley's death has once again put the spotlight on the dangers female runners face, wrote AP. Previously, the 2018 death, they wrote, of University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts, who was also murdered by an illegal immigrant, while out jogging prompted an outpouring from other women who shared their tales of being harassed and followed. While several social media users called out this angle for focusing only on quote-unquote female runners and referring to Iberia as an Athens resident, rather than noting Tibbetts was killed by an illegal immigrant and another is suspected in the murder of Riley. Not suspected, he did it! An illegal immigrant. A separate AP report on Saturday mentioned the police didn't know the suspect's immigration status yet, but it wasn't updated as of Sunday evening. Pretty sure that's not the lesson here, the Spectator contributing editor Stephen Miller commented. In a longer post, outkick columnist Mary Catherine Hamm wrote, Hi, female athlete here. I ran this exam trail every single week of my college career. I guess I could have been snuffed out before I graduated, had a career family, and the professionals at the AP would lie about the suspect because it fits a preferred narrative. The Democrats are killing us. Literally. Literally. And this piece of crap Biden, that's right, I said it. What are you going to do about it? He's got more blood on his hands. He lit up the Middle East. He paid for Iran. He paid for that attack on October 7 against the Jews. Let's cut to the chase. Afghanistan. Dead Americans. He did that. His incompetence, his stupidity, his stubbornness. He did that. Russia invaded Ukraine because the genius had an idea. Trump said no. I'm cutting down that pipeline. No more pipeline from Germany, excuse me, from Russia to Germany, Nordstrom. Biden comes in, he says, no, no, we're going to open that. And they say, oh, God, we got the weak guy. This is perfect. Perfect. 
Will this be a turning point like George Floyd? <gasps> what did Mark say? I said what I said and I meant what I said. She wasn't killed because she is a woman running by herself in a safe area on campus. She was killed because she was murdered by an illegal alien intentionally. Finally, the White House put out a written statement. But Joe Biden himself hasn't said a damn thing. Not a damn thing. You look what's going on in our cities, honestly. How the black community is being treated. They're not second class citizens. It's as if they don't exist. They're paying taxes to subsidize illegal immigrants to stay at five star, four star hotels, three squares a day. They're getting food, credit cards. What the hell is this? So in city after city, that community is angry. Well, of course they're angry. It's outrageous. And it's not just there. It's everywhere. It's in the suburbs. It's in the rural areas. It's on the northern border with states that barely have populations. It's everywhere. It's open season. America's open, everybody. Open. For criminals, drug cartels, terrorists, and of course those who want to work. Well, you know what? Americans want to work too. Despite you hear the smears about Americans not wanting to work. No, Americans want to work too. And so it gets harder and harder and harder for Americans to find jobs, especially those on the lower rung of the ladder who need to work their way up. But I'm sure Wall Street's happy, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, the others, over the decades who've pushed for this, they got it. Now they have it. Now what? So Joe Biden starts out by destroying every single protection Donald Trump put in place. Every one. And the wall is rusting. Rusting. The steel is rusting. They said he couldn't do it, but he did do it. And he got the president of Mexico to agree to things that never could have imagined, that his military would stop people from coming toward our border. That there would no longer be catch and release. That if people wanted to apply for asylum, they had to apply from Mexico or the country they came from, not while they're in the country, because they never show up for their asylum hearings, ever. 95% don't. And now he's going to tell us, Biden. Biden only does things that are politically expedient. And by the way, he's going to a part of the border. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, What did I do? Here it is. Bill Malusian, who's fantastic, of course. Interesting that President Biden has chosen Brownsville, Rio Grande Valley sector for his visit. It's been slow for months there. Only getting around two to 400 per day across all the RGV sector recently. Yesterday, there were 314 encounters. Meanwhile, San Diego and Tucson sectors busy in blue states. Typically one to 2,000 per day. Biden's last visit to the border was in El Paso after a huge surge of illegal crossings where the streets had been cleared of migrant camps and the visit was highly sanitized. Biden did not see to or talk to a single migrant nor did he visit a Border Patrol station. We'll see if it's different this time. Oh, it'll be different. But he's still a serial psychotic liar. Mark Levin. You are listening to the best of Mark Levin. I've played this before, but it's worth emphasizing right now. The former Democrat governor of Colorado, Richard Lamb, since deceased in 2003 in Washington, D.C., in an event where he was supposed to speak about something else, decides to talk about immigration. And, you know, when you have a show this large, all corners of the earth, people come and go. Sometimes they don't hear certain things, so I want people to hear this. 
He said, I want to tell you how to destroy America. Go. I would like to share with you my plan to destroy America. If you think, and some do, that America is too smug, too rich, too self-satisfied, not diverse enough, too white bread, I have this plan. Toynbee, you know, said that all great nations rise and they all fall. And he said, and the autopsy of history is all great nations commit suicide. So here's my plan, eight parts. Number one, I'd make it a bilingual, bicultural country. History shows us that no bilingual, bicultural country lives at peace with itself. There's not one, I believe, that doesn't exist with an incredible amount of tension they, that, and, and conflict, if not civil war. My second part of my plan would be to invent something called multiculturalism. This would be two parts. Number one, I would say that all cultures are created equal. It would be, make no difference and make it impossible to talk about such things as culture. And the second one is that I would really try very hard to make people continue their cultural identity. I would replace the melting pot with the salad bowl. My third part of my plan would be to make the fastest growing demographic group in that country the least educated. I would add a second underclass to the first underclass, unassimilated, undereducated, antagonistic, and then I'd have 50% of them drop out of school, not graduate from high school. The fourth part of my plan would be to get the big foundations to fund, and big business, to fund these efforts with lots of money. I would invest in ethnic identity and uh, victimology. I would get them to think about their lack of success was only the fault of the majority. I would start a grievance industry. The fifth part of my plan is I would develop dual citizenship. I would promise people actually divided loyalties, allow them to allow both for, to vote for both Vincente Fox and George Bush. The sixth part, and this is important, I would place all of these subjects off limits. I would make it taboo to talk about, actually, or criticize this whole thing. I would make it uh, come up with a word like heretic used to be 200 years ago. Let's say we call it racist. And I would try to accuse anybody of this that would object to my ideas. My seventh part then, I would make it impossible to enforce our immigration laws. I would develop a mantra, let's call it this, that uh, because immigration has been good in the past for America, it will continue to be uh, good in the future. My eighth and last part, and it's important, is I would censor this book. This man is dangerous. He's on to my plan. Don't read this book. Victor Davis Hanson's book, book Mexifornia. Now, they keep talking about bipartisan legislation that the Senate had prepared. It wasn't bipartisan. Three or four Republicans voted for it. That's not bipartisan. That's a joke. Mitch McConnell, with his, with his lapdog, Lankford, negotiated it in secret. So none of the other Republicans even knew what was in it. And they did it in secret because this is the way totalitarian regimes function. And so I wouldn't have it and warn you about it. But as soon as it came out, I read it. It was a long monstrosity. People on TV were defending it. They hadn't even read it. It had poison pills throughout. It had escape clauses throughout. It was not the toughest border bill ever proposed by anybody. Despite what liberals say on panels on TV and all the rest of it, it was a joke. Loophole after loophole after loophole and enshrined numbers of illegal immigrants in numbers we'd never seen before in American modern history. But there was a bill that was proposed in March, excuse me, on May 2nd, 2023, by the Republicans in the House. And it went to the Senate, called H.R. 2, and they wouldn't even discuss it. Now, you hear people say this, but you don't know what was in H.R. 2, do you? You hear people say, we offered H.R. 2, which was the most aggressive effort ever to secure our border. So what was in it? 
But let me give you some examples and why Schumer wouldn't take it up and why McConnell wouldn't fight for it. Among other things, according to its own summary, it required the Department of Homeland Security to resume activities to construct a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. It provides statutory authorization for Operation Stone Garden, which provides grants to law enforcement agencies for certain border security operations. It prohibited DHS from processing the entry of non-U.S. nationals, aliens under federal law, arriving between ports of entry. That is, no processing of anybody who tries to steal their way into the country. It limits asylum eligibility to non-U.S. nationals who arrive in the United States at a port of entry. It authorizes the removal of a non-U.S. national to a country other than individual country of nationality or last lawful habitual residence. In other words, some of these countries now, like Venezuela, won't take them back. And so this law, this would-be law, said, then you send them back to the last place they came from, like Mexico or wherever. Expands the types of crimes that may make an individual ineligible for asylum, such as a conviction for driving while intoxicated, causing another person serious bodily injury or death. Authorizes DHS to suspend the introduction of certain non-U.S. nationals at an international border if DHS determines that the suspension is necessary to achieve operational control of that border. Prohibits states from imposing licensing requirements on immigration detention facilities used to detain minors. The blue states, of course, were trying to regulate their way out of this. Authorizes immigration officers to permit an unaccompanied alien child to withdraw their application for admission into the United States, even if the child is unable to make an independent decision to withdraw the application. (coughs) It imposes additional penalties for overstaying a visa and requires DHS to create an electronic employment eligibility confirmation system modeled after E-Verify system requires all employers to use the system. Slam shut the border in between the ports. Slam shuts anybody seeking asylum in between the ports. The right to remove anybody through deportation. Prevents across the board in every instance the hiring of an illegal alien. And the other things it doesn't say here supplies significant amounts of money to beef up the border patrol to do border patrolling. Not diaper changing. This was HR2. No loopholes. Just right, plain English. And the Senate would not take it up. Less than a year ago. Instead they come up with this cockamamie crap where they want you to believe that Congress has actually done something, the President's actually done something. Joe Biden has burned down the border, and he's taking a fire extinguisher and telling you, let's pass this in the law, I will get credit for fixing the border, but every damn loophole we will exercise in order to actually prevent us from doing what we claim we are doing. This is a two-faced, mealy-mouthed, nasty, chameleon man in the Oval Office. He doesn't give a damn. We now know more about this poor girl, this nursing student. Her head was hit so hard with a blunt object so often that the medical report says Her skull was disfigured. That suggests you hit somebody in the head with a bat or shovel or God knows what. They fall to the ground and you keep pounding their head, Mr. Producer. I want you to think about that, how it sounded, what it must have done. A beautiful young woman who was going to contribute to this society and help people as a nurse. By some punk 
sleazeball from Venezuela who had committed other crimes while he was here, but not enough, apparently, for New York City to do anything about it. We've had up to 10 million people come into this country illegally. About 400,000 of them are unknown gotaways, they call them. They don't know a thing about them. Nothing. They're in our streets. They're in our communities. They're in our schools. You have no idea if your number's going to come up, if your ticket's going to be punched. You don't have the foggiest idea. Minding your own business, walking into a 7-Eleven. Minding your own business, taking the subway. Minding your own business, taking a bus. Minding your own business, taking a jog. It's all over the country now. People being raped and murdered and assaulted. We have enough of that in our country without importing it. Massive amounts of resources redistributed from American citizens, many of whom desperately need them, to foreigners, aliens who just step into the country and are handed credit cards, cell phones, hotel rooms, three squares a day. I mean, what the hell is this? Joe Biden's going to go to the border, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to go to the border in the next 36 to 48 hours. Where he's going to tell you, but for the Republicans, but for this legislation, but for Donald Trump telling them not to sign it, but for them making it a political issue, an election issue, but for all that, we would have a secure border. But I'm here, Joe Biden. I'm here to sign what I can do. I want to do more. They won't let me do more. But I'm going to sign an executive order, maybe more than one. And I'm going to secure that border the very best I can. And the media will applaud, and the leftists on cable TV. Why don't the Republicans just get behind this? I'm a person who believes in solutions. Why don't they just fix this? Put the politics aside. I mean, Donald Trump telling them, don't go for the bill. Donald Trump said, don't go for the bill because it is a horrendous bill. It is a lie. It is a fig leaf. To cover an ugly lie. And people opposed it and voted against it. Not because they were told to. They're not Democrats. Who walk in lockstep. Vote in lockstep. No. It's because they're patriots who know this is crap. And yes. It's about damn time that Joe Biden and his party is held to account. They call it politics. I call it responsibility and accountability. It's time to hold them responsible for what they're doing to our country. Whether it's the border, whether it's the economy, whether it's our police forces, whether it's the military, it's time to hold them accountable. And if that's political, so damn well be it. Mark Levin. The Great One makes your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. Here we go, America. So the Supreme Court just announced it has set April arguments over whether President Trump has immunity for official acts after he left office. Of course, the media with their propaganda set it up differently. Now, I've been the one voice, I think who has said that his argument is both rational and necessary. And if I'm wrong and he's wrong, that means that Joe Biden can and should be prosecuted for his violations of the Espionage Act when he was senator, vice president, and in the private sector, depending on the statute of limitations. Because a Republican administration, should President Trump win, would have the power then to say, uh, we appreciate your report, Special Counselor Herr, but we don't agree. And since we have a slam-duck case on scores of felonies committed by Joe Biden 
when he was not president of the United States. So there are no declassification issues of any kind. We will now indict you. Now, of course, the same can be on the civil side, but the court wanted to take up the issue of the criminal side. And on the civil side, the same circuit has ruled that, yes, police officers can sue Donald Trump, claiming that he somehow is the basis for any injuries they reserved, even though he's not been charged with any violence, insurrection, or sedition. The court didn't care. So what does that mean? That means that the families of people who've been murdered, as in Georgia and elsewhere, raped, lost their property or otherwise, personal or physical beings have been affected, will be free to sue Joe Biden personally. Personally. Here's how the Associated Press wrote it. Supreme Court sets April arguments over whether Trump could be prosecuted for election interference. See that phrase? Election interference. Election interference. They've already decided he's guilty of election interference. Not challenging an election. Not fighting an election. Election interference. So in their headline, they've already convicted him of a felony. But that's the Associated Press that accompanied Hamas in the slaughter of October 7th. The justice's order maintains a hold on preparations for a trial focused on Trump's effort to overturn his election loss. There they go again. The court will hold arguments in late April with a decision likely no later than the end of June. All this propaganda by the press by the phony former federal prosecutors, by the phony law professors and all the rest, are intended to put enormous pressure on Supreme Court justices. That's the goal now. But even with a timetable that is much faster than usual, the court action calls into question whether a trial for Trump, assuming the justice denies immunity, it can be scheduled and concluded prior to the November election. See, this isn't about justice. It's never been about justice. Even the way the media write about it. It's, come on, can we get this done before the election? For God's sakes, stop with the Constitution. Stop with due process. We've already decided he's guilty. We'll go through the motions, but let's get, let's get this phony, fake, fraudulent process underway. Trump's lawyers have sought to put off a trial until after the voting. Well, of course they have. By taking up the legally untested question now, and the only reason that it's a legally untested question It's because Jack Smith and the Department of Justice at the direction of Joe Biden are taking legally preposterous positions, pushing us into these constitutional areas where we've never been before. Let's see. The court said in an unsigned statement, it will consider, quote, here's the issue. Whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? I would urge the Supreme Court justices to look at the charges against this president related to January 6th. Look at the charges. Look at the stretch. The Klan Act. The Enron Act, which now the court has also taken up to look at, and a Federal Contractor Act, essentially, those are the three laws. And so we should now turn the Constitution inside out to allow the Biden regime and a rogue prosecutor who former Attorney General Mises said has been appointed in violation of the Appointments Clause of the Constitution so they can succeed at what they're doing. This would open a door to future prosecutions one can only imagine. Oh, I'll get to Mitch McConnell. Don't worry. Supreme Court has previously held that presidents are immune from civil liability for official acts. And Trump's lawyers have for months argued that protection should be extended to criminal prosecution as well. Okay, first of all, 
For over half a century, it's been the position of the Department of Justice under both parties, all attorneys general, all of them, that she cannot prosecute a sitting president. But after he's president, can you prosecute him for the official acts he's taken if there's an allegation made against him of criminality? That's the issue. And what will that do to an immunity when a president is president? Of course, it'll undercut it horrendously. And it will affect the way that a president operates. And for some judge or justice to say, well, then follow the law, follow the rule. That's not the issue. The issue is retribution. The issue is what's happening today. The effort to take Donald Trump off the campaign trail to interfere with the election, to interfere with the Republican primary selection process, to interfere with the general election at the behest of the party opposite and the candidate he's running against. We don't need, you know, hypotheticals. We've got reality. It's right in front of us. Lower courts have so far rejected Trump's novel claim. Is a novel claim. It's a novel prosecution. And the lower courts are all filled with Democrats. This is the Associated Depress, the Hamas supporting participants in October 7, Associated Depressed. A panel of appellate judges in Washington ruled earlier February that U.S. District Court Tanya Chunkin, she's appointed by Obama. Two out of the three judges on the panel were appointed by Biden who had presided over the election interference trial, was right to say that the case could proceed and that Trump can be prosecuted for actions undertaken while in the White House. The issue reached the high court because the appeals court refused to grant the delay that Trump has sought. The issue reached the high court because the panel refused to allow typical due processes to proceed where a claimant can appeal and seek the full court, not just three judges on a panel of the court, to hear the case. He was denied that. The case is separate from the high court's consideration of Trump's appeal to remain on the presidential ballot. Just look at what's going on. The effort to take him off the ballot. Now the court heard that. The effort to prosecute him for acts, not sedition, not insurrection, not violence, But the Klan Act, among others, the Enron Act, which has no place in this whatsoever, and a Federal Contractor Act. Basically, that's why that law was passed. He's not even charged, I would argue, with serious, substantive, related criminal offenses. They keep talking here about it's interference with the election, interference and insurrection, sedition. He's not charged with insurrection and sedition. The High Court will also hear an appeal in April from one of the more than 1,200 people charged in the Capitol riot. The case could upend a charge prosecutors have brought against more than 300 people, including Trump. Now, what's that? What's that? It's the same district, D.C. court with one of the same judges appointed by Biden who took the Enron Act aimed at corporate destruction of documents, corporate, applied it to January 6th as the only handle they could, they can concoct to charge these people with obstruction. So again, rewriting the Enron Act. And that is one of the two charges, excuse me, two of the four charges against Donald Trump on January 6th. The Klan Act, this so-called obstruction issue, and other. So we should turn the Constitution inside out to accommodate a rogue prosecutor and all these Obama-Biden judges. Of course... The Associated Press would never print it the way I explain it, but the way I explain it is accurate. We've got a lot to cover this evening in a a way that only I can cover it. I want to talk to you in a moment 
about this idea of the so-called uncommitted Democrat vote and how the media are literally covering up the Islamist influence in Arab and Muslim communities across this country, especially in Michigan, by talking passively about what's taking place. The uncommitted vote was led by Rashida Talib. I posted on this this morning. Rashida Talib is a Jew hating, terrorist supporting member of Congress with Palestinian heritage. Her parents came here from the Palestinian territory. She has voted against condemning Hamas. She has voted present when it came to the rape and the brutality and the sadistic conduct of the terrorists. She voted present. She's leading this effort. When you listen to what imams are saying in Dearborn, Michigan, and other parts of our country, all throughout California, and you have to actually go to places like memory.org and others to get the information, you will not find it on CNN. You will not find it on MSNBC. In fact, you won't find it anywhere but here. If I raise it. This uncommitted, they keep saying, wow, that's a lot of uncommitted. Why are there a lot of uncommitted votes? Well, obviously, it's not all. Islamists. It's also some people that go to young people in colleges and universities. But this is the drive. The Rashida Talib Hamas wing of the Democrat Party. They're not demanding a ceasefire for a ceasefire. They are demanding the complete abandonment of the state of Israel. They are demanding the obliteration of the state of Israel. That is what they are demanding. And they are now here in force in large numbers in different states, with enormous amount of backing from countries like Qatar, from organizations like Hamas. They're here, they're in our face, they're influencing our elections, and right now, they are blackmailing the Democrats and Biden. You either support our position, our anti-Semitic, radical, Jew-hating, Israel-hating position, or we are going to defeat you. Because now we are in the base of the Democrat Party. That's the truth. Those are the facts. Mark Levin. We're giving you nothing but the best. The best of Mark Levin. Has there ever been a more stark difference among our people? Not since the Civil War. In other words, we have one political party, the Democrat Party, that hates the country. That wants to change the citizenry. That wants to change the people they're supposed to represent. That wants to change our economic system into a socialist, neo-Marxist economic system. A Democrat Party that destroys capitalism and prefers something called climate change. A complete concoction. And yet they pay for the test results through the federal government. They pay for the, for the research that they want. A Democrat party that has eviscerated law and order. With rampant crime in our streets. A Democrat party that is eviscerating the United States military and our weapons systems. Have we ever had a party like this? A Democrat party that in conjunction with corporate media is constantly trashing our history, constantly trashing the majority population in this country, whether it be Christian or white or what have you, constantly Picking its scabs, constantly trying to divide us, create jealousies and create hate. Promotes the most loathsome professors, the most loathsome authors, the most loathsome ideologies, day in and day out. 
We have a Democrat Party that dictates to us what words we may or may not use. We have a Democrat Party that now attacks the independence of the Supreme Court. It used to be you don't talk about justices in the court this way. But now, again, through their media, Democrats, elected and unelected, surrogates from all walks of life, trash the justices, threaten the justices, claim that the justices are just there to do the bidding of Donald Trump when they don't get the result they want, which is forget about the trial, forget about the appeal, forget about it all, just throw Donald Trump into prison. And maybe he'll get the Epstein treatment, Mr. Producer. Now, when you face this and you see this, and you still have Republicans who ignore or pretend that these threats and dangers aren't swirling around the American people, then as far as I'm concerned, they're aiders and abettors. That's what Nikki Haley is. That's what Chris Sununu is. That's what Larry Hogan is, and so forth and so on. Just as Joe Biden relies on Islamists. Just as Joe Biden relies on individuals who want to see the obliteration of Jews, the obliteration of Israel, relies on individuals, Marxists, who attack our history, who attack our founding, who pull monuments down, who reject the Judeo-Christian belief system that created this country, the Declaration and the Constitution. Doesn't mean the rest of us have to follow. When I see my buddy Hugh Hewitt go on there and slobber all over Mitch McConnell, it embarrasses me. And he's not alone. When I see the candy asses at the Wall Street Journal editorial page do the same thing, It's stunning to me. When I watch Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney, who is a chameleon, a man who's never stood on principle for anything at any time, just like his daddy, say what he does and do what he does, makes me sick to my stomach. You would at least think that the Republican Party that was founded as the abolitionist party would be united in their opposition to the efforts by the Democrat Party to abolish our republic, to abolish our constitutional system and replace it with an alien ideology that they've been pushing for 120 years. Progressivism is, after all, the progeny of Marxism. So now they attack Christian nationalism. Nobody even knows what the hell they're talking about. It's made up. It's a fiction. A white dominant society. Nobody knows what they're talking about. It's made up. It's a fiction. They create these fictions. They create these pseudo events. They create these lies through which they put their agenda. Every damn piece of their agenda is intended on burning down this society. Burning it down. Their great hero is Bernie Sanders. Their great hero is AOC. When I watch people like Michael Steele or Joe Scarborough or Liz Cheney or Kingsinger or the disgruntled reprobates who left Trump, sold books, got media jobs and accolades, these, these are the people who are aiding and abetting those who are destroying this country. They are backstabbers. I am deeply, gravely worried about this. We keep getting these pieces written at the National Review and Wall Street Journal and their ilk. How can Trump attract the Nikki Haley supporters? They're running ads now in Virginia. Nikki Haley is. I'm watching them very carefully. You know what she says? Absolutely nothing substantive. Nothing principled. No pushback. No pushback. 
against this counter-revolution to the American Revolution. Nothing. How do we get her voters? We know where Donald Trump stands on the issues. We know where he stands. We know what kind of president he was for four years. He was a damn good president. We know he's not going to destroy democracy. Democracy is being destroyed by Biden and his party right in front of our eyes. And actually, the phrase is constitutional republicanism. But we'll play along at least for a while. Our military is on its back. People don't want to join anymore. Our local police forces are on their back. The only police force that's growing is the federal police force. And it's different iterations. The power of the police state. Not local police forces. And then they lie to us, which is what totalitarians do. Oh, crime is at record lows. Violent crimes at record lows. We know why. It's not being reported. It's not being prosecuted. So they play with the numbers. And so you're supposed to be Helen Keller. I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. We see what's happening to our stores. We see what's happening to our subways. We see what's happening in broad daylight on our streets. We see little kids being murdered at fast food restaurants. We see what's going on. And they tell us crime is going down. They tell us inflation's going down. When inflation, core inflation, even said it in a report today, is way up. What's core inflation? It's the inflation they don't count. What you put in your mouth and chew and digest, that's not counted. What's over your head, a roof. That's not counted. The utility bills that come in, that's not counted. But core inflation, the things you need to survive, is through the roof. So they have to lie. They lied about the border. They told us for three friggin' years, the border was secure. It's operationally under control. You heard it. How many times do I have to show it and play it? Now that the public says, in Democrat cities, no, it's not. These people are taking over our streets. They're committing crimes. They're taking our resources. They're in our schools. They're in our parks. They're, in our, they're everywhere. They have nowhere to live. They're defecating in the streets. And when they can, they're getting five-star hotel treatment. And when they can, they're getting food credit cards, for God's sakes. And they qualify for a whole bunch of welfare programs. This is a country that's being destroyed from within. By the Democrat Party and Joe Biden. And the worst culprit in it all. Are the media. Because the media. The media is populated by Democrat Party apparatchiks. I don't mean they're being sent into the media by the Democrat Party. They are Democrat Party apparatchiks. Story after story, Sunday after Sunday, evening after evening, morning show after morning show, it's trashing Trump. Or Christian nationalism. That's been going on for six months at CNN and MSNBC now. All, you know, Islamophobia, you see, that's the problem as they trash Christians, as they trash trash Jews in the media, or anybody that stands up and says, wait a minute, what are you talking about? The ignoramuses in the media, they are stupid people. Jake Tapper is an enormously stupid man. Wolf Blitzer is an enormously stupid old man. Andrea Mitchell is a long-in-the-tooth, incredibly stupid woman. And I could go on and on. They put individuals like Joy Reid on television. Like Rachel Maddow and others. The filth, the vile, the poison, the cancerous attacks that come out of their mouths. Because there are no more standards in the media. There's advocacy. That's it. 
That's it. The only Republicans they put on are Republicans who attack Donald Trump and attack those who support Donald Trump. So desperate are they that they try and create the impression Biden taking the lead, then Kamala Harris, Hakeem Jeffries, Chuck Schumer, the whole bunch of them. That tens of millions of hardworking, red-blooded, tax-paying Americans, many of whom are veterans, police officers, firefighters, many of whom are electricians and truck drivers and plumbers, many of whom are construction workers, bricklayers, doctors, lawyers, whatever, that they're white supremacists, even when some of them aren't white. And democracy is at stake. The party that's trying to put the party opponent in prison. The party that's furious that the Supreme Court took up a major constitutional issue and didn't let Donald Trump go straight to the guillotines. The parties whose district attorneys are trying to interfere in a federal election and are in fact the party whose judges whose judges are ruling that Donald Trump shall be removed from the ballot so Republicans don't have a candidate. Democrats in major cities who want illegal aliens to vote, making it absolutely impossible to know who's supposed to vote and who isn't in federal elections. And we have these Republicans who aren't sure if they're going to endorse Trump and worse and worse I posted something and it says Biden already trying to steal the election in addition to trying to imprison his political opponent Joe Biden is doing a number of things to steal the election one record annual salary increases for the fast federal bureaucracy in other words paying them off two four hours of paid leave for federal bureaucrats to vote Three, four hours of paid leave for federal bureaucrats to work the polls on election day. This is all your money. Four, half a billion dollars in student loan forgiveness with the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional to buy the votes of millennials. Five, federal student worker program, also your money, will now encourage students to register voters for extra credit. This is all aimed at third demographic groups. Six, healthcare.gov enrollees will also receive voter registration emails. They're stealing the election right before our eyes. 